Clap it's, your hands, all you people. It is different reading your Bible. I hate it. On the, I, I, di- I haven't, uh, you know, I didn't start really bringing my physical Bible back to church until probably some last year and, and mostly this year. I've been doing yeah, the... Probably, probably just how good our church is going. The Bible app. Yeah, closer I got to the Lord, the more <laughs> I was like, he's only in physical pages. <laughs> he's restricted. To, no. <laughs> he's not in the app. There, what what is it about though? It feels like it's better to have a physical Bible. Uh, I don't know. Is it just because I'm old? I I think that there is a psychological connection to our phones because every time we pick our phone up, it's for a dopamine rush. It's social media. Come on, we know what we're doing here. I'm I'm sick of it. I'm ready for the whole grid to crash. Okay. Wow. That's not true. I, Robin told me the other day that she wants to go back to the 1820s. No, she doesn't. I said, no, no, you're, now, not, you're not thinking this I through. wouldn't mind pinpointing right after we really got efficient air conditioning. And maybe that might have been a simpler time. But I, I was thinking the other day, because somebody was like, well, they didn't have air conditioning back. You know, whatever, 1910, they didn't really have air conditioning. Dude, my dad didn't have air conditioning when he was growing up. Okay, this is a great segue here. My truck doesn't have any heat. Okay, that's right. bad. Every truck has heat. But, I mean, that's well, basic. Well, here's that's... the deal. Here's the deal. It, it's only bad because I know the goodness of heat. Mm-hmm. I know what it's like to have air conditioner. So to say they were living without this stuff 100 years ago, yeah, and they didn't know how good it was. Well, I, I they told They weren't Robin, missing anything. I said, if we go back this far, my first thing that I think of is medicine. The advancements of medicine. I'm like, you would die from strep throat. Okay? Like, she's like, well, some people lived. I'm like, sure they did. I mean, that's... Less but, frequently than they do now. I'm telling you. Just I mean... every time you've had an antibiotic in your life, you would just still have that virus. Yeah. Or about whatever you take antibiotics However for. long that would last. I mean, I would... Yeah. I, I mean, we would just... We would just die. We just died lots back then died lots we died lots of times in People. the bible they cast lots but a hundred years ago they died lots <sighs> they'd be casting a lot that's a weird thing hey i got questions lots. about that <laughs> they hold on hold on for a second <laughs> this is not what we're talking about today they chose who would be the 12th disciple who would be the 12th apostle with a roll of the dice yeah, I mean, but, you know, that proverb says that the I know, lot is cast know, in the lap. But hold on. Every decision belongs to the hold Lord. Hold Can we just walk around flipping coins and be like, well, that was God? I think... I'm, I'm just putting this out there. It seems to me that it's one of those... When they don't know what the right decision is, they're like... God will decide. I think we can't draw conclusions on that. <laughs> I, I do got that. That that might be one. Wherever I have to this wait. lands is God's will. <laughs> <laughs> if not uh, one anyways. rogue molecule, Dylan. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh. So this is episode. What are we on? Fourteen. I keep forgetting. I don't know where we are. Well. Uh. Yeah. As, as yeah, this is 14. This is 14. Undone Podcast, welcome back. Uh, sorry we were jabbering about stuff that doesn't really matter. Um, but this week we couldn't decide what we were going to do the podcast on, so we cast lots. No. <laughs> and it was the Lord's will. Um, now, I, I was uh, in the process of putting together songs for worship this week, so I'm the worship leader at Stone Chapel. And um, you probably know that if you're listening to this, because only our church listens to this podcast. Probably a select few of our church. <laughs> <Only a> few. <laughs> uh, and as I was picking out songs, you know, there, there's there's a little bit of pressure on the worship leader to kind of keep, you know, like what's that balance between newer songs, older songs, too familiar, too new, you know, up tempo, slow. You know, I tend to, I prefer a little more up tempo songs because the slow ones, I just feel like at some point it's like we're just trudging through mud here. And I just am like, I want, sometimes if you over slow the worship set, it's like putting me to sleep. So resting in the Lord. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, but like literally like, 
<laughs> like, I'm like, but okay, so there's there's all these components into that go into what makes a decent worship set. What's even the standard that we're measuring this by? And over the course of the last two years, as I've been you know more in God's Word than I ever had before. Uh, the picking out the worship set has necessarily become more about lyric than style or tempo or any of these peripheral things. It's more like, what is this song saying? When I'm opening my mouth and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to engage the Almighty God, I'm approaching Him and I am expressing something to the God of the universe that I serve, my Lord, my Savior, what am I saying to him? I'm paying more attention to that than ever. And I, and I just started noticing, I had somebody that suggested some songs to me, and, um, and I, was look, I was listening through them, and very quickly, I just was turned off to the songs. And I'm not going to sit here and paint with a broad brush and say that these songs are bad. I think it's every... Uh, individual congregation has this has their unique DNA or whatever and it's up to the shepherds of that congregation to be able to say hey I you know it I, I would say it's their responsibility to have their finger on the pulse of the congregation seeing what they need you know what do these sheep need where are they at and um, and I'm not an elder at our church but being put in the position of worship leading leading you in worship I'm sitting here listening to these lyrics and I and I'm going man, these newer songs are very about me uh, as mm. as the as the worshiper. It's just it's all very focused on me, what I want, what I need, and I'm not saying there's never a time. Sure, but sure. it seems like the scales have been tipped from glorifying God to. God, just help me. Just help this stuff. Help and, help know, all the things that I need. That is uh, that. This this shift of very me focused, very I centric, uh, it is everywhere. Yeah. It's 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 all over the church and culture, and anyways. Well, it's it, it, okay. It is reflective of our culture, and um, gosh, I mean, get on social media so, for ten minutes. And, Matthew six. Yeah, we're talking about the Lord's Prayer today. Yeah, I I like Matthew six. It's also in I think Luke eleven. Uh, in that gospel as well. Um, but Matthew, Jesus gives this uh, almost a, a precursor to the the Lord's Prayer as we know it. And one of the things he's talking about is not praying in a, in a public fashion for your own glory. And we do that in worship songs. And I th- and I I told Ben earlier. I, th- I know I talk bad about the Western Church, but we're just absolutely hideous sometimes. <laughs> Ugly. Yeah, yeah. We are so me centered, and uh, this is very stereotypical of cult leaders. Oh, uh oh. It is it the is the c word. The sen- It is the sentiment <laughs> of glory to me in the name of a higher power. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of our worship is like glory to God in the name of me. Yeah. And I I think it's dangerous. And and yeah. I, what what I've noticed is is a lot of our worship songs and when I say of recent, I mean since like, you know, 2008 whenever I became aware of worship music because I joined youth group, right? Uh, uh is a lot of our worship music is is like Ben said it's not necessarily bad, but it's also not reflective of scripture. And I think that's something we need to get back to. Yeah, it's, you know, when, when you see David saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. And he's he is commanding his own inner man to bless the Lord. Our, and I, I was looking at our, our format in our worship songs, and I'm going, are we doing this? Are we blessing the Lord? It does not feel like blessing the Lord when, when every single song that I sing is about, God, I'm facing a giant, and I really need you to... To bail me out of this when I'm in a God, I'm in, every song is like I'm in a tight spot. Can you, uh, <laughs> you know, God? Any, and I, I do think that many people have been conditioned to go, uh, you know, whatever it is that you're struggling with right now, that's what you pour out in your worship experience. So, you know, I, I'm really struggling financially right now, or I'm, I'm really, you know, I've got this family turmoil, or um, I've, you know, I, I really need, need a new vehicle. Uh, my transmission's going out. 
That's actually happening to me right now. Um, but all these things, great. These are these are things that we are concerned about, and I think that the Lord does care about those things. But at the end of the day, when we approach the Lord, how are we instructed in Scripture to do it? And the Lord's Prayer came to my mind as I was dealing with this. We we're not going to be doing the podcast on this subject. It just came to me because of what I was preparing for the worship service. And I was, I was like, why am I getting more and more frustrated with the lyrics in these songs? And uh, to your point, you mentioned, you know, leading up to the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, and this is chapter 6, verse 7, it says, And when you're praying, do not use meaningless rep- repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So so this is getting into the Lord's Prayer. It's, the, it's before He even says pray then in this way. Don't, the, the needless, meaningless, that's the word, the meaningless repetition. And I, I think about that sometimes when I'm singing, I'm in, I'm in a, uh, a worship service and we're singing and I'm like, I'll catch myself, my mind wandering into nothing land. And I am, there is no better definition for what I'm doing than I am meaninglessly repeating words. Mm. I don't even halfway know what I'm saying sometimes and I'll look out the congregation and I'm not trying to judge based on your your physical um, activity I whether am. or not you're <laughs> worshiping but the, but I do notice a pattern that it is like zombies out mm. there um, and this is just not there's something there's a there's a missing connection there's a vacuum somewhere where it comes to how we glorify God in our worship and I, I I'm painting with a major broad brush here but I want to just focus for a few minutes on the Lord's Prayer as uh, I don't know like a metric for how we should approach the Lord because this these are the words of Jesus these are literally the Lord's words and he says pray then in this way and it says uh, so let me jump over the whole thing real quick our father who is in heaven this is new american standard version by the way for those of you that are reading along our father who is in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen the very first thing that jumps out at me is that the first half of the prayer has nothing whatsoever to do with me. It doesn't even, I don't even enter the equation. It's just, uh, except to acknowledge that it's our Father that I'm approaching. Yeah. That's about it. It's just talking about you're holy, you're wonderful, you're perfect. I want your will to be done. God, I pray that your will would be done, not mine. I'm not, even, I'm not even talking about my needs or my desires or my wants or even things that I'm going through. None of that is even entered the equation. For the first half of the prayer, this is a relatively short prayer. And I think that we know that this is not an exhaustive list of exactly bullet points, how, uh, what you should pray, but it's more of a template of how you should pray. And he says for the first half, our father who is in heaven, I'm acknowledging he's Lord, he's God, he's King, holy, hallowed be your name. This You are set apart. You are otherly. You are unique. There is none like you. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is is in heaven. So the way that it is in heaven, the way that your will is done, I want that done here. That's, That's what we desire, that that would happen here on earth. And it's not even until that point that we begin to enter into the equation on prayer. And it says, give us this day our daily bread. I, don't, I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't help but notice that this is the basic necessity of sustaining life that we ask for. We we haven't begun to talk about God meet my fa- financial needs. Right. God meet meet this thing that I'm dealing with. This giant. It's there's not even a me- there's no there's there's not even an Old Testament me- metaphor that we can point to. Uh, for our uh, circumstantial needs. This is a basic fundamental meet my need of life. Yeah. My daily bread. And of course, we know that Jesus, when he speaks of himself and saying, I am the bread of life, that manna that came down from heaven. So it's even further than just our physical need. It's it's our spiritual base necessity. God, you're holy and I need you. And that's all I need. 
that's what I need. I'm acknowledging it's even though we enter the equation, all we're really doing is acknowledging for me to live, to survive. I need you. Give me that. Yeah, it's almost reminding ourselves that he is all that we need. Right. And we need nothing else. Yeah, it's that's it's it's I, a it's this it's as base as it is base need as it gets. Like there's there's nothing it's saying fundamentally none of that other stuff matters if I don't have you. I saw a video today on social media of a uh it was a, a some registered nurse and her husband I guess was a nurse and first of all side note here soapbox stop stop putting videos of yourself crying on social media all right i mean that ship has sailed dude they're they're don't not do stop that. that don't do that the grid's gonna have to collapse stop it for that to stop <laughs> this is silly quit quit putting videos of yourself crying on social media all right secondly she was upset and okay our economy kind of sucks right now okay no no uh no ifs ands or buts about it inflation's awful who are you voting for I'll tell you, I'm I'm not voting for our current president. <laughs> so, Kamala. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I am a raging conservative. So he's full of rage. Once it comes down to the general election, I will vote for whoever aligns with that most. Uh, anyways, so how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it. Well, talking about oh, this lady crying on social media. So yeah. she was crying about how. You know how bad the economy is, and both her and her husband have really good jobs for the most part. And she was told if she went to school and got a job that you know they you know the American dream, whatever you can buy middle class, okay. And uh, it, that's not been so for her. Uh, her and her husband live in a, a modest home. She said it was eleven hundred square feet ranch style house, and that they got paid this week and and paid their mortgage and bought some groceries and put gas in the car, and all they have left over is two or three hundred dollars until Friday. And she's she's crying about this. And listen, okay, I understand you were sold something, and it, it, it's not living up to what you were told it was. Okay, economy's not great, uh, but my goodness gracious, there are hungry Kenyans right now. Oh, he's going into it. There's kids in Africa. There are. that would love that food. You eat your dinner. Okay, but you have two to three hundred dollars <laughs> left over, and I'm just I, I think it's very indicative though of of the church of. You know, we we have viewed whatever desire we have as our as a a pertinent need. It's like I need this, and it's like no, you don't. Yeah, you don't need that for life. You don't need that for godliness. You want it. You may desire it greatly. You may need it for your plan for your life. But what if that's not what God has for you? Yeah. And I, I I'm not here to preach a, a poverty gospel either. I don't I don't think that God desires for us to be poor. But I do think that when we look at the Lord's prayer here, to what Jesus is asking God for. It was recognizing our most fundamental and singular true need is in him. Right. Yeah. And and we take our laundry list of wants and desires and and throw it like a, a dart at a dartboard, like see which one of these God's gonna answer. Yeah, and I think it's it comes down to because immediately I, I am already I have people in mind that are that are maybe watching or listening to this that are already I, I, I know Who? they're they're mad. Okay. <laughs> I know they're already going, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. But what about, forget the whatabouts, man. We focus so much on the exceptions. We don't ever have room for the rule. We don't want to hear the rule. But the rule is obviously the rule for a reason. It's the most important part. And we have, and I, I keep using this analogy, but we have tipped the scales. I, I, I do believe that there is a balance, but not in the traditional sense where they equal out. When it comes to our worship of God, our needs need to be uh, completely out of balance to God's glory. Yeah. That's that's immediately without God's glory, our needs are it's impossible for them to be met in the first place. And if we are not glorifying God, we don't even we're not able to even abide in Him in a way that we can ask as we should. It, we approach God with that with our needs and our wants and our desires we put that first it, it seems like naturally yeah. in in our human condition that's what we do is the first thing we do is we come to him with this we don't come to him uh in an authentic posture of praise and worship and the the prayer goes on um f immediately after give us this day our daily bread so there there's your there's your gimme 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 that's the only one right there it immediately goes on and forgive us forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And I do want to switch over, flip over to the other account in Luke that you mentioned. 
It was Luke 1, wasn't it? I thought it was Luke 11. Or Luke 11. Yeah. Luke, yeah, it wouldn't be Luke 1. Two ones. Yep. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Uh, give us This is this is more like a condensed uh, version of it. Give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our... And so, so the other one says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And this says, and forgive us our sins... For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And I, I could not, all I'm doing is I'm thinking the condition of man, that our sin puts us in debt to God. And, and when, we, mm. when, we're, when we're asking him to forgive us our debts, it's, it's our sin. It's our transgression that we're asking him for forgiveness as we forgive others. He says, if you don't forgive men, I don't forgive you. This, there's this connection that even when we pray this, Jesus is, is instructing, pray for your forgiveness. And intertwined with that is as you forgive those who sin against you, who trespass against you. And there's this model of what the cross is going to mean, what it means, what his righteousness means to the believer as we approach God. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So if you're looking at the word evil here, evil is in reference to the word temptation. So it's not just simply saying, deliver us from, you know, all the wickedness that's around us. Yeah, my evil, that that adversary I have at work, (laughs) deliver me from him. Or deliver me from this. No, the evil is re- is referring to temptation. He just got done saying, forgive us where we trespass against you. And it's saying, protect us from the evil of temptation. This, this harkens all the way back to the garden. The evil one. What did he do? He, he pulled Eve. He pulled Adam. He said, hey, I know God told you this. But surely he didn't. He, he didn't, didn't mean it. He didn't mean this. This is what we're praying right here when we say, <laughs> deliver me from that. It's, well, you know what this is? If, if we boil it down, it's saying, guys, God, God, fix my eyes on you. Yeah. On you and you alone. So when we come to God in, in praise and worship, we say, God, give us the, the very basic thing that I, first of all, we're saying you're holy, you're wonderful, you're, you're full of glory. Uh, and, then, and, then it's, and then it's that what I need from you, God, is, is uh, the bread of life that sustains my very existence, mm. that I live on that that you know man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that proceeds from the father's mouth that's that's the further part of that when jesus is tempted in the wilderness by satan and he he says you know i know you're hungry why don't you just go ahead and uh, you know command that rock to become a piece of bread and he says for it is written man does not live on bread alone but on every word that proceeds from from the father's mouth and it later he refers to himself as the manna as the bread from heaven and then deliver us uh, from evil, from temptation, God, protect me from temptation. And all of that, the temptation that would that would draw me away from your presence, that would draw my eyes away, that would that would cause me to glance over here. God, protect me from that, fix my eyes on you. And then all of that is for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So you could you could back that whole s- statement up by saying because your yours is the kingdom and yours is the glory and yours is the power forever and ever because of that all of this you're holy. Yeah. You're holy. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, essentially your entire approach of God is I am nothing, you are everything. And and that posture right there sets you up for, therefore, I need what you desire for me. And Jesus is telling what he desires. He's, he's giving his heart in this pattern of prayer. And I'm wondering if we have missed it in our approach in worship because we think this is just a prayer thing and somehow that means it sure. doesn't doesn't play any role in how we approach God in worship. We're like, well, sure, I, I pray that way. I kind of aim my prayers that way, but I worship about me. So the last the last few years, uh, I since we planted Stone Chapel, when did we start Stone Chapel? I guess almost three Father's years. Father's Day was Almost it? three oh. years ago now, yeah. Yeah. Going on, going on year three. Um, I've been very intentional to try to keep man out of the way of what God wants to do. Of course, we fail in that, uh, but that's the effort. That's the goal. That's our aim. Um, and I've noticed that as, as 
most recently I noticed that, uh, you know, Jesus is pretty clear in, in uh, Matthew here, Matthew six, like don't, don't pray as a performance, right? That's not what we're here for. Don't consider yourself righteous. Don't pray. Don't pray in that way. Don't be hypocritical. Um, and at the end of worship, like many churches, somebody closes out worship and prayer. It's usually me cause it's right before the sermon. And I've caught myself like, how do I reword this? How do I how do yeah. I say this this prayer differently? Uh, and I can't because I don't want to change the prayer because the sentiment is when when you remove yourself best we can uh, from from our act of worship, and we are trying to just focus on God and I mean humble ourselves to the point that we're you know not even giving heed to what's going on in us. Yeah, I'm focusing on Him. That song that we see in Revelation that heaven is singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. That it, it, it is God-focused, it is God-centered, it, it is Christ-exalting. It is, it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can even do these things. And the prayer, it, it, I don't have to reword it, but it, there, you know, there's a human inclination yeah. to like, I want to say this, yeah. I said this the last five weeks, yeah. God, you're holy. Mm-hmm. And I think that all that is is a testament of our... Not, not that we're perfect, we're not at all, but that our hearts are, are right in this endeavor of trying to keep our worship pure, of that's what it, for, for me, that's what it's been producing in me is, wow, God, you're yeah. holy. And, and I've, I've been trying to ask myself, why do we not, why is this a struggle for us at all? It seems like a very basic, <laughs> why is this a struggle? And I really do believe this because the enemy is just trying to suppress the truth in unrighteousness Mm. and this is the word of god we are enemies of god outside of the blood of jesus outside of being born again we are rebel sinners and we suppress the truth of god in unrighteousness and so our flesh is inclined that direction we are we are leaning into Mm. our own desires until the spirit of God is transforming us that, and we have this wonderful word of God, this revelation of God right here, that when we meditate on it, 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 it renews our minds. And I was looking, when I was looking in James, there's, you know, how they put these little, um, you know, everything's been divided up in chapter and verse sure. now. Okay. When did that happen? Do you remember what year? No, they, I don't know. That, I, that was like fairly recent. I'm going to say 1800s. Okay. We'll double, I would have we'll, no idea. Yeah. We'll double check that. I don't think the verses and the chapters were added until around somewhere in there. We'll have to look that up, but I'm pretty sure that's that's true. Moses actually etched those into the stone with a smaller chisel <laughs> well, when I, he was. <laughs> I always laugh when I see like a like a phrase at the top of the scripture that is, uh, you know, this this is James chapter four, and it says things to avoid. It actually makes me mad when preachers use that for their sermon. <laughs> right. Like that's not no. Right. But that's what, it, so that's some, that's been put in, but I, I'm looking, when I look at the actual text, and I'm going to read a little bit here. Um, I'm going to start at, at verse three, chapter four, verse three, it says, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Whenever we ask and we don't receive, what's our, what's our knee jerk reaction? Well, just ask again, just keep asking. We don't. Do we ever think for a second that maybe it's because we're we are uh, the reason we're not receiving it is because we have wrong motives, so that we may spend it on our own pleasure? Do we ever do that? What do we say? Of course, we don't say that. We think, no, I don't have wrong motives. I mean, I'm here at church. I'm not asking you for this to spend it on my own pleasure. God is is smarter than you are. He's more in tune with your spirit than you are. And we know that our hearts are deceptive above all else. So you may be asking something in what you think are pure motives. But this is what James, Brother James says to us, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. And then it goes even further. Man, it starts digging it away in here. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What is your praise and worship? Is it friendship with the world? I'm starting to wonder when, when we enter into praise and worship are, are the things that we're petitioning God for more reflective of a heart that is really closely tied with the world. Mm. And, and that's why people go, I didn't really get much out of that. 
I didn't I didn't get much you out of it. You weren't supposed to get something out of it. It wasn't for you. I think we've been blessed <laughs> our our church in particular has been blessed with because when we started we don't have, we didn't have anything. <laughs> I, I'm so, I'm so. Listen, listen, listen. I was thinking, I was telling somebody the other day about, I think our very first Sunday ever, I think you had played a festival. Was that the first Sunday? I think so, yeah. And you back. drove all yeah. night yeah. to come set up our Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> that was great, man. Yeah. And it was a sound system that's been sitting in my barn for <laughs> years, and so it was rusty, oh, and man. squirrels have been eating pieces of it. I have a picture of the auditorium that I took. The, for our first Sunday ever, everybody had left. I was walking out, turned around, snapped a picture for memory's yeah. sake, right? Yeah. And I was going back to my phone, and then I was like, well, they tore that down. And then I got to the gym, and I was like, they shut the heat off on us yeah. there. <laughs> we, like, have, we have been a wandering people. I, hey, I, and, I, and I'll tell you this. I think this speaks for probably several of us of the original group that started the church. Um, I needed that. I, I needed the humbling. We needed a timeout. Okay, I needed it. I needed to get. I needed to get uh, broken free of the the haze machine and and the lights. And I know that that gets like overly demonized as yeah. if lights and <laughs> haze are bad or something. But anything that is put in front of God is bad. Okay, the, the earth is the Lord and everything everything therein. But if you put creation in front of the creator, it's bad now. Yeah. Okay. And so I, there was a stripping of all those things that for me was necessary because I had to get over myself. I had to get over the comfort. And, and all I had was this, uh, this bad acoustic guitar and this horrible sound system. And But we had the Lord. Oh, yeah, we had the Lord. <laughs> Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks no, speaks to no purpose? says, he jealously desires the spirit which he has made dwell in us, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. And the, he could have just said, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. But, but he, he, said, he said, cleanse your hands, you sinners. <laughs> My th- does it say filthy sinners or just sinners? Um, mine doesn't say filthy, but oh, I'll, dang I, it. I, I, I'm sure, you know, you're a sinner. You're filthy. <laughs> yeah. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. double-minded. Oh. And then it, 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 I mean, it just doesn't stop. He says, be miserable <laughs> and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. This gets me all excited to hear someone talk to me like that. I mean, (laughs) God can talk to me like that. Yeah. Yes, he can. (laughs) Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. We don't do that. We exalt ourselves in the presence of the Lord. We're singing, I exalt me. Yeah, I exalt (laughs) me. I mean, you never you ever watch those videos where somebody accident? I've done it before. I accidentally I mi- I mix a word up. It just inadvertently happens, and I'm singing heresy out of Dude, nowhere. Dude, it feels bad too. You're like, oh, I mean, Lord, you you're good, you're worthy. But how many of us? What maybe we're not? You know, I mean, I look back at the scripture. It says they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I mean, how many times? You might be saying, I exalt thee, but you mean I exalt me. That is what you mean. I mean, that when we come in, and I would never have acknowledged that I was doing that. But I now know that I was. And it's bothering me more and more. You know, there's this joke in the sort of like Christian worship CCM world that the way that modern uh, Jesus songs are written is in the format of Jesus is my boyfriend. That's the way that it is. Oh, gosh. And, it's, and that sounds horrible for so just many reasons. But, of course, it, think about it when you're singing some of these songs. They're very much a romantic approach to Jesus in in a very childish and immature sort of uh, like you're dating the Lord kind of way. Yeah. There's no depth of relationship. Oh man, it's lacking depth. It's la- it's lacking sincerity. But what, for what for sure, what it's lacking is humility, and that's what James mm. is really driving at here. I want to dispel yourself. something real quick before you move yeah. on from this thought. Uh, in in Luke 11, that account of you may have been getting to this. No, go for okay. it. Okay, that account of the uh, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus continues, 
And uh, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, leave me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers, Do not bother me, the door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish, and he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? <clears throat> if you then, being evil, oh, there it is. Oh boy! If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father ask the Holy Spirit? How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So this scripture, I think, gets used a lot for, I'll, 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 we'll call it prosperity gospel, because that's what it is. If you ask, if you knock, you'll find. If you seek, you'll find. If you ask, you'll be given. Uh, and, and that's just not what it's saying. It is saying if you seek God, you will find him. If you humble yourself before the Lord, you will. he will give you the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is not... Uh, I've been I've been claiming that house, and I know that when I put my offer in, the Lord's going to give it to me. Right. That's I, 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 if that happened to you. I'm sorry. That was a coincidence. That's yeah. not scriptural. Yeah. I mean, God God's going to do what God wants to do, uh, but I think that most of us, what we do when we approach the Lord is we're looking around. That guy's got that stuff. <laughs> I want that stuff. The Lord did that for them. I want that stuff. We're not looking at God. Look at God. Look at God. Don't look around at everybody else. When you're at the foot of the cross, you don't pay attention to oh what else is around goodness. you. You look up at the glory of your Father. Yeah. I mean, and when I think about what Jesus did to reconcile man to God, the sacrifice that he gave, I'm, I don't even want to ask for a raise at work. How dare I? How dare well, I? Well, I mean, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. I do know what you're saying. Nothing else matters. Oh, it just and, and and here's the thing is if if you're if you're at that place, if you actually can recognize that that nothing else matters, you're not going to be struggling with how to approach God. That's it. This kind of reminds me of that scene in, uh, I think it's in Bruce Almighty, the Jim Carrey movie. Yeah. Where he's he's doing all this big stuff for Jennifer Aniston's character, his girlfriend. Yeah. And she he's, she's getting her nails done. He's sending her to get a massage, getting her ready. And she thinks he's going to propose and ask him to marry him. <laughs> hey, do you remember this yeah. scene? And when he's in the... Uh... When he's saying he got a raise. And when he got they a... go to the, 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 the restaurant and he gets down on one knee and he's like, I got an anchor. I got an anchor. That's what we're doing to God. He's he, yeah. we come into worship uh, or allegedly to worship Him, allegedly. and we're like, God, I want this car. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. He's like, what? Yep, yep. Not that He's surprised, but yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while, while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say. If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. It's my assertion that this this is our worship services. We come in there, we know the right thing to do, and we don't do it. It's sin. And we're... We're offering that to God and calling it worship. It's wickedness, and it's and and of course I'm only even seeing it now because I'm in the I'm in the Word to a greater degree than I was before, and God is humbling me, man, and putting me in a place where I am ashamed of how I I approached Him, even as recent, you know, very recently. Okay, I mean, gosh, I'm out, I don't even know. Last week I was singing one of the songs and I got choked up and I'm supposed to be leading this and I couldn't have and I get frustrated with myself because I get choked up and it's like it, it literally it cuts my voice I cannot say a word anymore and I'm like I gotta sing this lyric I'm leading them in worship but it's I'm getting overwhelmed as I'm as I'm reading the words and thinking about what they mean to me and it was um what song was it it's the one um death was arrested oh man 
and sometimes I look at some of the older. Okay, so I'll, I'm, I'm, I want to make this a little practical for a second because yeah. for me, you know, I have worship. There's worship artists that I don't love uh, the, the way they sound or their mm-hmm. style or whatever. One of them to me, and I, I'm, I'm, he'll never even hear this. So what does it matter? I'm gonna send it to him. I'm not the biggest fan of Chris Tomlin. Oh my word. Okay, I, <laughs> I, I don't really love his voice. I don't really love the style of his music. Um, if I'm talking about the style when it comes to worship, I, I much more prefer like the elevation stuff or whatever, musically or whatever. And some of them lyrically are fine too. Um, but what I noticed was I threw in one of his older songs from probably like 2001 or something. I bet all the hands in the whole room went up. They all went up. But I, when I was reading, I was lis- listening to the words as I was listening through the song. And it was like the splendor of the king clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. And let me just go ahead and tell you, the rest of the song is pretty much just like that. He wraps himself in light. Mm. Darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice. How great is our God? How great is our God? How great is our God? Over and over again, how great is our... Let me tell you something. That's not meaningless repetition. That's meaningful repetition. Yeah, that's good. And it, and it's 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 just exalting God instead of me. So I, I wouldn't... I'm not suggesting that we never come to God with our desires. Sure. But I'm saying we have no business doing that until we have blessed the Lord in our praise and worship. And so I want to tip the scales back because I just think they're out of balance um, in our in at, in at least the circles that I've been around. So I don't want to speak for every church. There might be a church down the road that's got this 100% right. You know, and I'm not trying to to just blast our congregation. Right. But I do know our congregation. I know our congregation. But we should be the most critical of our congregation. Right, we should. Yeah. And we should be able to recognize it. I mean, yeah. if you can't recognize in your own congregation the weaknesses and the strengths, then are you really a part of that assembly? Are you really... How is that? How can you call it fellowship if you're like, I don't even really know yeah. where it buys out? You should. You should be able to tell you know what your congregation is struggling with and where they're thriving, you should be that tight. That's why you can't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You are one body, the body of Christ. And so I think that that as we, over the past year and a half, have gotten tighter and tighter as a body, those the little things that maybe weren't glaring before, they, they become a little more evident. Yeah. And it's like, and so I, I just, you know. The honeymoon phase is gone. That's, I guess. <laughs> I don't want to be mean. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm calling myself out here, yeah. to be honest with you, because I have I have sort of, um, you know, mindlessly uttered words. I didn't even thought about it. Theologically, what are the implications of some of these things that I'm saying? Some of them are just straight up not good. I, yeah. I've retired some sets from the worship list, um, the set lists, uh, just because I was like, I can't believe we were singing. They're probably that. some of my favorite songs. <laughs> it's no, I'm kidding. <laughs> just a few, you know, where I'm like, this isn't. This is just not. There, yeah. Most time, it's not that it's negative, except that there's just nothing there. Yeah. It's so shallow. I haven't even reached for the heart of God. I love the. I love that we're talking about a corporate worship setting right now. Right. Um, the Lord's Prayer itself. Not one time does Jesus pray, "I, me, my." It's all our Father. It, yeah. This is a. Of course, he is Jesus, so he's able to speak for his whole body. But this prayer is a collective. It's not me focused. It's still it's it's God and then us. And I I, I think that's beautiful. I think we miss out on this concept of of corporate worship often, and a lot of it is due to I think the worship culture in the Western Church. You know, I, I don't have any stones to throw at you know old. Hillsong or, or even Bethel or Elevation songs, you know, I, I cut my cut my teeth on them. Uh, but it, it was, we measured how much God moved by close your eyes, cry at the altar. It was a very individual experience that we just had in the same room together. <clears throat> I was reading a book. I'm, I've got this in my Can throat again. This? Yeah. <clears> throat> uh, I've got a, in, it's it's the country's birthday. I did. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I thought you it. need a safari? Yeah. Looks um, it's uh, the, uh, what was I saying? Oh, I was reading this book by a pastor named Mark Dever. He pastors a church in Washington, D.C. And he uh, wrote, wrote a book about, about the church. And one of the things he talks about is in our corporate worship, we should have an awareness of our togetherness. 
Yeah. And and how a lot of they are they are more reformed churches, um, but they'll you know they'll they almost won't lift their hands sometimes, yeah. and I I don't think we should draw that line either. Relax. But the, <laughs> we had a our our church hosted a men's conference last year that attracted a lot of reformed people yeah. that came into our our building. It wasn't Stone Chapel's conference, but we were just hosting it. Um, but uh, it was funny. We did worship at it, and you could you could tell who was who just by during the worship because the guys that were like mega reformed, you know they they don't close their or lift their hands but they'll stand there just barrel chested yeah. and sing <laughs> eyes wide open <laughs> well i was gonna say i because you know we went and sang some um christmas carols is what they ended up being but they were just hymns uh in front of the courthouse oh, yeah. with uh, one of our presbyterian brothers uh several weeks ago you know during the christmas season and one of them was god rest ye merry gentlemen and i was singing the lyrics and thought man the, the lyrics the theology is really rich in this song i've never thought of it this way before and then um, Sunday, you're preaching on the Sabbath, and that uh, that Christ is our rest, and that we rest in Him. We find our Sabbath in Him, and immediately I was just like, "God rest you, married gentlemen." And I looked up the <laughs> lyrics, and I just because I, I wanted to read through it again, just thinking about that, and it said, "God rest ye, merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember, Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy." Next verse. God rest you, merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power. That's the same exact word. Hold on a second. Um, <laughs> where is it? Oh. In Bethlehem in Israel, the blessed babe was born and laid within a manger upon this blessed morn to which his mother Mary did nothing take in scorn. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. I'm, I'm, I'm reading this now for the first time. I, I would say, God rest ye merry gentlemen, mindlessly. Yeah. I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking, I don't know what this means. I just wasn't thinking about it at all. Yeah. But then, you know, listening to the, the uh, description of Sabbath and I was like, oh man. Hold on a second. <laughs> oh, tidings of comfort and joy. I find my comfort and joy in the rest that is found in Christ Jesus, in his righteousness, that he saved us from Satan's power, that nothing can cause me to dismay or to feel downtrodden or to feel separated or to feel defeated in any sense of the word because I, I am comforted and filled with joy in the rest of Christ, my Savior, and and that and it's a, it's a it's a beckoning for the people of God to find their rest in yeah, Christ. That's good. And so when I now reading these old lyrics, I'm like, oh man, these old hymns they pack a different kind of punch. We're, we're, we're trying to so artistically write a love letter to Jesus that we make it all about us really presenting God with these romantic okay. jewels. But we've we have forsaken teaching in the church true uh even even like because I, I i think there's somewhat of a delineation in preaching and teaching yep uh but you know when i was when i was a kid which i'm not that old so this was not that long ago we had sunday morning sunday night and wednesday night service okay yep. and the sermon was at least an hour at all of those so we've gone from more than three hours of teaching to people saying you need to keep your sermon to 30 minutes like not well first of all no i don't think i will but secondly <laughs> i don't think you can we but. have <laughs> i'm just getting warmed up at the 30 minute mark uh secondly though we have we have just failed uh over the last whatever y however many decades you want to choose to teach doctrine in our churches and over and over again paul tells timothy i think at least five times in the first letter like give yourself the doctrine give yourself the teaching play co play close attention to your teaching exhort with the word of god there there is this mandate on the church to be educated of who god is what the word of god says and we haven't done that and so i think that's reflective in popular worship today of i think that it's it's like whenever you hear two 12 year olds tell each other i love you and it's like <laughs> where you have you heard this you don't uh, i used to tell all my girlfriends i love you <laughs> and then you don't know what love is though yeah and then you hear like like don and pat rose in our church they just celebrated 61 years of marriage yeah when don rose tells pat rose i love you yeah okay that that means something right 
there's something to back it up there. Right. And I think that's what's happened in the church is we're writing love songs to God. And it's like, we don't even really know all that he is. We don't yeah, understand who we're talking to. I, it's so funny because it's like, we think that we are doing it right by saying, sometimes we, we think, well, it's, I'm singing. I love you. I love you. I love you. That, those are great words. But he first loved us. And that's the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, the things that you talk about 12 year olds, they're mimicking what they see in maybe a real relationship. They might be mimicking yeah. the roses, like oh, they love each other. But what did they do? They have a lifetime of going, of sticking with each other. 61 years, listen. Yeah. And, and, and I look at God and I'm like, that's the sanctifying process. Yeah. He loves me yeah. so much that he has drugged me along, sometimes kicking and screaming into his love. And that's what I love about God, that he loves me in spite of me and he loves me thoroughly. Yeah. And I'm gonna worship him that way. I'm gonna worship him however he tells me to. If I don't like it, tough. I'll I'll get out of the way and I'll figure it out. What this word says, I want to do. That's the yeah. that's the change I think that is necessary. And it, again, you're saying you're picking on Western churches. What's well, it's what we know. We're here, yeah. and, and I'll say that it's I've me. Tra- I've traveled all over yeah. the country to various churches. I used to be. Uh, I I don't I don't consider myself much of a worship leader to be honest with you. I'm I'm not super comfortable in the role, and especially the closer that I get to God, the more inadequate that I feel in the role. But I would travel to different churches than, and I was in a rock band. It was a Christian rock band, okay, you know whatever you want to call it. But I would travel around, and the churches a lot of times would they put the youth pastors especially would do this, be like, well, we can't really afford to just bring in just to uh, you know play a concert. But I tell you what, if you lead worship um, before you know service we'll let you play afterward or something like that. It's like a bait and switch. Like, Mighty to save beforehand. Yeah. Hashtag yeah. douchebag afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, they didn't know what I was going to do, but they would have me come in and, and so I'm having to lead worship and I'm like, and I do love the Lord, but I'm like, I'm not a worship leader. I, I'm really just trying to get a paycheck, I guess with this. And it, it felt so disingenuous. And I'm like, how can I be surprised that our, our youth in particular, when we started stone chapel, yeah, you said to me, I do not want to lead worship, but I will because I know you need me. Well, no, actually, I had told him, <laughs> I, had, I had laid the foundation before he ever asked. I, you know, I don't like leading worship, by the way, just to let you know that. You know, for no reason, I just want to let you know I don't like it. <laughs> then, you know, it's only a matter of weeks when he goes, hey, I know you said you don't like and you don't, but, man, just for a little hey, while. Hey, man, we're three years in, and now you're like, this is it, dude. <laughs> well, I just am like, you know, this is where God's put me for 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 whatever season I, I'm here. I, I you know he I do believe he's wanting me to do this, so I'm doing this. And when this people is, try to reject something like a position yeah. or a title, that's how you know that's them. Yeah, I, I what, hold on a second. Hold that's on what it second. is. I was hold like, it's been. It's, hold this, on. This is it. Yeah, that's why it must be you, Maximus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I but I I, I just. <laughs> God, God has done some fun, funny stuff with me, man. And um, you know, you look back; it's so easy. You know, we all do this. We look back and we're like, okay, okay I can see God's hand, you know, in and throughout my life, um, through my stupidity, and He used that, um, and through my brilliance, which luckily I give Him that often. He, you don't have that experience, though. What do were you? you reading in James? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I would, I would, do, I would have these these services where I'd be sort of manipulated into leading worship for a, a youth group or something, you know, like they're dangling a check in front of me, like okay. And so I'd do that, and then I would, I would sit there and go, man, no wonder our kids are leaving youth group. You know, by the time they're seniors, they don't know squat about God. They had been as a worship leader. They, they, had, been, they had been peoples as a worship and, leader, and I, I, and I, Dylan I, as a <laughs> as a as a youth leader, and, and they're like, and they don't know anything about God. They know how to cry when the lights turn down, but that's it. Oh no! And then therefore, I feel personally if, targeted. If they don't cry, they're like, I guess God's not here. I didn't cry today. That is very real. Yeah. I've been uh, over the last last little bit uh, trying to reach out to some of the students, and I'm like, I really messed up with that one. Yeah, and just being like, Hey, man, I'm I'm sorry. What do you say to him? Just I'm sorry. I say that I was very young in my ministry. Not that I'm old now, but I I I I would not have led in the same way. And if I misrepresented who God was, and I'm certain I did in many fashions, I'm sorry. <laughs> And a lot of them are just like, man, thank you so much. I can't, I couldn't stand you then. And I'll, I'm always like, you know, you probably wouldn't stand me well now, but yeah. I just, yeah. I don't want to taint your view of God. Yeah. All I know is, uh, you know, 
as we're on this, you know, we're, we're on this path where we're just sort of trying to say, Hey God, I just want to read your word. And, um, and every time I come up against a wall that, that that's me basically, um, we'll just knock that down and we'll keep going. Yeah. The Bible's not a menu to open it and figure out what God's going to do for you. Right. The Bible is revelation of him and our response should be our father who is in heaven. Yeah. Holy is your name. Yeah. I mean, you could just stop park there for a little while. Okay. <laughs> God, you're holy. <laughs> Just stay there and say that over and over again. I mean, um, so yeah, I I don't know, you know, if this is like a, a general, like I'm just a rule that I'm I'm like, okay, I'm only going to sing songs. It's not it's not like that. It's just I I can tell where God is pushing me right now with our congregation and everything is, you know, hey, I think an issue is that we need to redirect our our path that we approach God into a path of completely honoring him for his glory, for his wonder. We need to get back in awe of God. Yeah. We don't need to, we don't need to start out with, okay, I know you're God, so you can do all these things. So just do all these things for me. We need to just start out with, I know you're God. Yeah. And you're worthy. And if that means you're so worthy that you're worth more than my peripheral desires, then I'll just forget about those and give all to you. And I bet I would be well willing to bet. I would be willing to cast the lot. <laughs> oh my word. I'm sorry. We've come full circle. I'd be willing to bet that if you shifted your worship in that direction, those desires and stuff, I'm not saying they would all be fulfilled. I'm saying they would change. Yeah. And you would be fulfilled. And I'm not saying that the goal is your fulfillment. I'm saying I really do agree with Piper on this, that he is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That that joy that we seek, it's in his presence, is the fullness of joy. In his presence. So we approach him the way he says, the way he tells us. What I love about like the the account in Luke is that it it it's it started off by the disciples saying, Lord, teach us to pray. They're even asking. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know how to do this right. I know you do teach us. I don't want to ignore that anymore. I think you said today, you said, I think the Lord's prayer is pretty much just like the, how did you put it? Like the pattern of to life or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it is. I think that's, that's exactly what it is. It's not just, Hey, this is what you do when you bow your head and close your eyes. I think it's, this is what you do. The end This is what you do. And I don't want to dismiss, uh, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of fruit. And if you don't know how to pray, start by just reciting that word for word. That's a great place to begin yeah. prayer. There, you know, there's there's a ton of prayers in the scripture that we can look at to learn to pray. And I don't ever want to elevate, you know, uh, I don't want to pretend like the words Paul wrote are not still the, the same word of God that Jesus spoke in Matthew or, or in Luke. Um, but I... I think that there's merit that we look at the disciples learning to pray from Jesus, that this is the heart of God. And, and we see this beautiful, you know, that a lot of the other, what I'm getting at is a lot of the other prayers we read about, like what Paul prays for the Ephesians. I, I love that prayer so much. Uh, it was, it was a specific purpose of, I pray that you would comprehend with all the saints, what is the love of God. And this prayer was purposed with what is prayer how what how are our hearts supposed to be uh positioned towards god you know what 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 is the what is the heart of man in prayer and we see this prayer just so beautifully conveys our god centered position in prayer that we our our prayers should be god centered not me centered not i need this and and I think what's really tempting is to, I know we're kind of wrapping up here, but to draw a line of, okay, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, these materialistic things are not important, but this request I have for, you know, my, my health or something that's more serious than a car or a house or money. Uh, and even then I say, let your prayer be God centered. There, there is no pain or agony or tragedy on this earth that compares to the glory of God. You, you, the, the thing, okay, just dovetailing on what you just said there, see, J James kind of addresses all of this, uh, even before what I had said. When he starts out his letter, mm. and he says, Consider it all joy, my brother, brethren, when you encounter various trials. 
knowing you need to let this sink in right here because this is going to mess up your theology. I guarantee you some of it if you just actually read this. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let ev- and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God is in it. <laughs> so he doesn't... So, your trials, your things that you that you have been elevating, that you've been saying, oh, "This got to be fixed, got to be fixed." God, God's, you know, someone's doing this to me. Maybe God is saying, "Yeah, me. I'm doing it to you. I'm perfecting your endurance. I am, I am allowing you to experience these very trials, testing your faith." to have its perfect result. And then it says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So there's a wonderful, I really can't argue with this. It's telling me something specific to come to God with. And it's saying, ask, ask for wisdom. That's the one. Bingo. Ask for wisdom. Who give, Come to God, who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind for the man ought not to expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord being double minded and unstable in all his ways. So I I just think there is a major correction right here to say you guys are whining and complaining about the things you need from God. And this was written to people that we would have said they're allowed to. Right. (laughs) Yeah. They yeah. were getting, they were dispersed. They were, they the were 12 tribes who are dispersed <clears throat> abroad. And then he goes persecuted greetings. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, James is very, he's very much, you know, it, it can be frustrating. He's very much, Hey, I, I know that you guys are being, you know, completely just ravaged and destroyed by the enemy. Greetings. First of all, um, <laughs> count it all joy. Fullness of joy in yeah. his presence fullness of joy let him change your heart and therefore change your desires because as you abide in him and he in you then you're going to get to that place where you're not double-minded when we come in worship and we i'm just use the term we we pretend that we're there for god that's called double-mindedness because we actually have another agenda and it's all the things we want and I, I just don't think we have business talking about what we want until what we want is what he wants. Yeah. And that can't be done outside of him. That can't be done apart from him before you come to church. You, you can't, you know, work all that out and decide, okay, I'm going to bring my wants. You, you got to settle the, the issue with him first. Get, get to the place where you're, you're going to be lifting prayers that are basically coming from his heart. It's very cyclical the way that it, that it is laid out here in scripture. It's like, you know, you get what you desire. But we got to fix what you desire. <laughs> but your heart is deceptive above all else. <laughs> I mean, so, that's it. Yeah. Oh, that's a, we just talked about this, how to read your Bible. We're like, oh, you know, I, I have the desires of my heart. He gives generously without reproach. <laughs> yeah. Whatever I want. <laughs> Keep yes! knocking. Keep knocking, baby. I get what I ask for. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I know we were trying to get to a wrapping up point, but you, you, you like Sorry, dipped your toe into something else. I opened the like, can. Ah, yeah. I can't. Um, but I, okay, so songs and worship and the Lord's Prayer. So uh, yeah. I, j- just to kind of wrap this up with a, with a with a story here. So I've been pay- I I like to pay attention closely to words. I'm probably not quite as anal as Ben is, but that's why he's the worship leader at our church, and I'm not. Uh, so I, there's this song by uh, Red Red Rocks Worship, which I I love. I, I'm trying to not you know endorse every single word they say but i will say i don't currently know of something that they sing in one of their songs that i would say is bad doctrine yeah uh, not to say it's not there i just haven't paid attention close enough right. i like i like their worship a lot um they have a song called good plans which i'm always really hesitant because that boy that's a slippery slope right there <laughs> all right all right it's a great song and there's a line because g- god has good plans absolutely he does plans to prosper you never to harm you mm-hmm after you go through this 70 years of exile. (laughs) 
So I'm always I'm always leery of these these types of songs because it, it can teach a gospel that is me centered that it's it, it looks like it's about God but really it's what the, what I benefit from God yeah. and it's actually not what you benefit from God but this song it, there's a line in it I'll, I'll 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 get there sorry no you're good it's he has good plans and then the next line is in deserts and gardens oh yeah he has good plans and I think that that is a beautiful picture of 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 that God is good and he's he is good in the way he defines good and we are tasked with worshiping who he really is and yielding that and bowing down and surrendering and 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 casting our crowns and and giving up all that we want and desire for him for his glory and for his kingdom and that's the blessing is we get to do that yeah yeah, he doesn't. We're, we're not. We're not worshiping because worshiping he gives us the desires of our heart. We're, we're worshiping him because he gives us a heart that desires him. Yeah, uh, he is. He does have good plans for us. Reconciliation to God. That's a wonderful plan. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus, for that plan. Um, anyways, yeah, we're we're getting off into preaching. We're circling around this. So, we were initially going to be um, tackling this week a little bit of the ish, of the topic. Of deconstruction, which is, uh, you know, that's, you know, been the buzzword over the last probably 10 years or so. And I think that, um, you know, I I do believe that God is preparing us to be able to talk about that. uh, And that part of it is we're laying a little bit of a groundwork for some problems that have been within the Western church that have led a lot of people down the path of deconstruction and yeah. I'm not even going to give like a working definition of that yet but I think that maybe uh, two weeks from now we should go into it a little bit and um, and to do it in a, a sober-minded kind of way where we acknowledge hey there's a reason that this is happening and it's not just that people um, you know are idiots that, s- that many of this rests on the fault of churches not teaching doctrine not equipping the saints uh, and that basically we have raised people to reject God. I think that's that's maybe that's a harsh way of putting it. Yeah. But I do think that a lot of times we have done that, and um, and so I want to address deconstruction in the next podcast episode, and we will do it gracefully but with truth. And I hope you guys will tune in for that. Good. All right. See you next time. <laughs>